So we are going to move in to our next session. And the question is quite simple and it is clear. Are soft skills the skills of the future? I don't know if you have soft skills, but I believe I have some. You know, I've, I've, I have loads of them. So we are going to have uh, Kavita Bindra, uh, the Assistant Dean and Executive Director of Executive Education from Yale, who will be our wonderful moderator. Let's welcome uh, Kavita and her team with a round of applause. Thank you. everyone, good afternoon. Um, I have to say I was a little nervous about the energy level in the room for a mid-afternoon session, but I heard all sorts of singing and clapping before, so I think you know, you've set the bar pretty high for us in terms of uh, bringing the knowledge to you this afternoon. Um, once again, I'm uh, Kavita Bindra, and uh, we're going to be talking today about whether soft skills are the skills of the yes, future. Yes, I am heating up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, so I understand uh, that, that the prior panel set us up uh, very well for this discussion. Um, so today we'll be talking about how new technologies and artificial intelligence are transforming the workforce and in many cases are substituting human beings in a number of jobs. Despite this transformation, soft skills or personal attributes that enable someone to interact effectively and harmoniously with others continue to bear great value for the future of work. These qualities may include emotional intelligence, creativity, and leadership, and remain unique to humans versus machines. As career paths evolve and become less linear, how can we ensure the development of important soft skills in education programs? And how can organizations place value and facilitate the development of these competencies among their employees? Uh, today, I'm joined by several speakers who can help address these questions. Uh, first, we have Karin von Hennep, Minister, did I, Yay. I got that, okay. <laughs> um, uh, Minister of Social Affairs and Employment for the Dutch government, uh, followed by Florence Ferraton, uh, Managing Director of Russell Reynolds Associates in France, uh, followed by Paolo Ribota, CEO of Zurich, France, and last but not least, uh, Denis Gaillot, Group People Engagement Director for Bell. So um, I'm going to start with a question to each of you around how we can think about soft skills, sort of a definition. And Denny, I'm going to start with you. Um, how, do company, how can big companies adapt uh, their recruitment processes to ensure soft skills are given importance, just like the hard skills? Well, I, I think it's not just about the recruiting processes. You know, it's all about uh, talent management processes. So it's for uh, potential new uh, employees, but also for, uh, for current employees. And, uh, and frankly, the, the theme is our soft skills are the skills, the skills of the future. I think that soft skills are the skills of today. Um, you know, in the environment that we are living in, you know, where everything is changing so fast and probably faster than ever before. Uh, in a company I work, work I, I belong to, uh, we are in a kind of a reinvention of our activity. And all this make, make clear that we have a um, business activity transformation, a growth model transformation, but also a cultural transformation. And the cultural transformation is about mindset and behaviors and in the end, soft skills. And the way we do it, so I believe that do a being, uh, in French, savoir être, is, is, is already now more important than doing, or at least equal. Great, thank you. Um, Paolo, can you talk about how the emphasis on soft skills has evolved? Uh, for example, is there more attention being paid to these types of skills by more recent entrants to the labor force? And how do you facilitate soft skills learning among those employees who may not have valued these as much in the past? 
Uh, I'd like to echo a little bit what Danny said about soft skills is very much not just about recruitment, but it's very much about how you make sure that your population and the people you work with are growing and are, uh, and have, and are displaying the behaviors that are the right behaviors or the how. I sometimes very often refer to the what and the how. The what is not the problem. The what you can acquire, you can learn, you can, you can train, uh, etc., which is an important piece, don't get me wrong. But the most important thing is the how. And the how, uh, how, the, the, how the behaviors, what you display in terms of, uh, Denise referred to mindset, uh, to communication, to problem solving, to critical thinking, there are numbers of, of soft skills that are important there, is a key element in the evolution of every company first. Secondly, I think is the role of, of corporation is to make sure that the people that work within the corporation, whatever is their entry level, can, can grow, can develop, can follow somehow their attitudes. And I think our role is to create the conditions to make sure that the some of these soft skills are well valued. So, for example, but I don't think this is peculiar to our company, I think it's every company, whenever we do the, the typical performance management assessment, uh, we look at the what, but what really makes the difference is the how and not, and not the what. Thank you. Um, so speaking of the what, Florence, um, what do you think are some soft skills that new technologies and namely AI could never compensate for? And what do you think is the right balance between technology and the human touch that makes both clients and employees comfortable? So before we talk about new technology, if you allow me, um, I would like to emphasize, emphasize the, um, the way we have evolved through the years about the assessment of profiles, including on soft skills. So in the past, it was all about par past performance predicts potential. So it was more hard skills in that, in that condition. So it's knowledge and experience. The second generation was more around measurement of growth potential. So we really started to deepen our assessment of the big blocks of competencies, where we added some new notions that, such as learning agility, drive, resilience, EQ. And today, and you'll see the evolution here, it is really interesting to understand that now we start thinking about potential realization. Could talk about that during hours, but to make a long story short, it's all around self-knowledge, values, purpose, derailers, and these factors can significantly accelerate or derail progress in one's career. So it's a long answer to back to your question around AI uh, and new technologies. And of course, we can't go <laughs> against progress. It's, it's going to be a great tool. Having said that, I firmly believe that you know, everything that is around interpersonal sensitivity uh, that will never be compensated by AI or technology. So this is the way you connect to people, how you adapt, how you adjust, how you create trust with people. It is so important when you need to manage some change or transformation projects. And you can use AI, you can use tools. And we, you, we in the way we assess our profiles, uh, we do use a lot of tests, a lot of data, uh, AI as well, but we use them as a tool, not as a center of our assessment about people. I'm not even, because I don't want to take too much time, I'm not even talking about the way we assess people when they need to integrate a special culture. It's all about soft skills, it's not about AI there. Thank you. Um, so, Minister, um, in your experience, are there specific soft skills that are particularly crucial for women's empowerment in the professional realm? And how can we tailor educational and training programs and the labor market to emphasize these skills? Well, thank you. That's a, that's a pretty broad uh, question. Um, but let me start by saying that when we talk about soft skill, that's not just for women or about women. I think that's for all of us, um, to put that first, I think. Secondly, when we talk about uh, leadership, soft skills, I think we have to start with the question of equity and equitable opportunities. And I think that's the journey that now our societies and our companies are going through. And I really feel that we have to move beyond our unconscious or even conscious biases. 
Because to be honest, we all like to recruit, promote, have coffee with, invite for a nice project, somebody who looks like us, but is five years younger. Because there you recognize yourself, I love recruiting women who are in their mid 40s, have children still in lower school, are internationally oriented and love technology. Duh, that's me, but five years ago. <laughs> and as long as we keep this rhythm of inviting people for coffee, uh, recruiting them, promoting them, that look like this, we won't reach diversity, let alone inclusion. So we have to make a conscious effort uh, to be diverse. We know diverse teams perform better. And a conscious effort to be inclusive. And I think that's where soft skills start. Um, and then you come to the discussion of leadership. And my personal journey has been from IQ. I started at McKinsey. I was very much about analyzing stuff. EQ, who am I? Who's the other person? What drives me? To LQ, which is love at the workplace, which also is about inspiring people, about the why. Why are we doing this? Why are we, I'm now in politics as a politician, why do I have this view as a company? What do we aim to achieve? And why is that important for us? And then you come to questions of how people can thrive in a culture that embraces soft skills. That's about don't tell them how to build a bridge, ask them to cross the river. Also a very famous sentence, but it shows something about culture. It shows something about a situation where people can thrive, where they can learn something, where failure is an option. Um, and that builds a culture where soft skills are nourished and soft skills are necessary. But I think it all starts with the question, are we ready to be an inclusive society? If I can jump in on this, I think there's a fantastic uh, English expression, which unfortunately happens quite often, which is, we hire them because they're different, we fire them because they're, we're not, they're not the same. Uh, which, which calls very much to the topic the Minister was alluding to about the inclusivity of a culture, I'm talking about organization, but it's not just organization, everywhere. That inclusivity piece, uh, it's a fundamental part of the soft skill and uh, the culture of a company. And maybe to build up on this and what Florence was saying earlier, it's very much about how, how to build a working environment where trust, authenticity, uh, empathy is, is present. And you know, at Bell, what we do in the, in the cultural program we have, which is called We at Bell, we have a specific uh, section on, for managers, we managers at Bell, defining what we expect from managers, and we train managers, all 1,600 managers, on how to build this, uh, this type of relationship, efficient relationships. And it's about empathy, it's about active listening, it's about questioning, it's about feedback, it's about managing emotions, and, and this is a prerequisite for building and, and the need to, to, uh, to build this inclusive environment. Uh, so, Denis, building on what you just said and the minister's point about teamwork, um, can you talk about ways that uh, you can overcome obstacles to effective teamwork in a diverse work environment? That, that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, yeah, it's very specific. It is very specific. But you know what I was referring to. You know, efficient relationship is is the way. You know, it's about understanding, listening to others, asking questions. Well, first because you understand the situation, but also be, because you make people grow by asking. First because also you show interest in what they think, which is very much about recognition, and is very key. So it, it's about dialogue. And and at Bell, you know, in in the processes. We try to develop conversations. That's what we, at, in HR, we build conversations, not just HR, but we favor conversations. Because the con from the conversations, you, you get to, uh, by applying questioning, listening, you, you, you ease the, the situation. It's also true, by the way, in the way you assess soft skills. We decided, because soft skills, how do you measure and, and evaluate soft skills? We've decided to go with concrete behaviors so we have decided, uh, we have defined seven winning behaviors, as we call them, uh, which are tackling and, of course, linked to soft skills that we want people to embody and, and demonstrate on their, their everyday life. 
because that will help, if everybody does that, that will help the company to better adapt and compete uh, on the market. And, and the best way to evaluate, especially to avoid bias, is to get 360 uh, evaluation. You know, to have conversations, but not one-to-one -one conversations, group conversations, feedback, you know, 360 feedback, because then you may eliminate bias or you may add up biases, by the way, but if they are not the same, maybe then you get a full, uh, a clear picture. Exactly. I just would like to rebound on what you said, Denis. Um, in inclusive culture, um, that allow people to be themselves, so to reveal their soft skills, and that unlock potential. And you've seen in a lot of companies, and, and weirdly enough, um, in family-owned companies, uh, where they've taken so much risk on people, and, and you see some last appointments in the market where they manage to appoint female leaders, young, bright, but younger, and not the usual suspect for, uh, for CEOs just by the fact that they were known, they were fit to the culture, they were themselves, they were authentic. And this is the way things will move forward, I think. And, and if I may add, I think that all starts with, as a leader, showing what kind of behavior, what kind of promotions you want to show to the world. The way I behave has a huge impact on my organization. Um, and be uh, to be aware of that is the first step, but then to actually model the behavior you would like to see from other people, sometimes it's a challenge for me as well, to be honest, but that's what we try to do. Yeah, role modeling. Role modeling. Very important. And, and there is a topic about, I think, somehow making sure that the rules of the game are clear and are uh, adhered to by everybody. So rules of the game about openness, uh, transparency, and overall, I would probably just condense it into a word, which is trust. Uh, teams are effectively, if there is an underlying trust, where everybody can express themselves, including on, on different views and opinion, and there is respect for somebody else's view, there is a, there is a tone of voice, uh, and, and so forth. So there are a number of, of elements that you try to instill and distill, even in the teams, uh, and sometimes you have to readjust. Uh, because sometimes you have to readjust, but I think that the trust piece is probably one of the key pillars for team effectiveness. Thank you. Um, so building on this uh, question around role modeling and leadership from the top, uh, Florence, at the heart of the activities of Russell Reynolds, there's also the recruitment of leaders. And we know, especially in uh, leadership roles, soft skills are essential uh, to thrive. So how do you go about identifying soft skills in leaders? So that's a, sorry, that's a good question. We've actually thought about it uh, since a long time, and we've built partnership. We've built partnership, for example, with Hogan um, to use the, some data uh, on what successful leaders look like. But to make a long story short, a long story short, sorry, um, we've built a model in the assessment of the leaders. I try to be as simple as, as possible but we usually take the four key blocks of competencies to assess, to assess the, the performance of one leader. Make a long story short, we've added to these four blocks some soft skills that can seem completely contradictory, um, but we tend to think that successful leaders have the ability to span from these contra contradictory notions, soft skills, to adapt to different contexts and, and different types of people. Let me give you an example. So people leadership, which, which is one of the four blocks of the, um, of the assessment of individuals. We have added two nuances that can, that can look like completely different. On one side, heroic leadership. On the other side, vulnerable leadership. So what is an heroic leader? It's, it's someone who commands and inspires leads from the front, um, or overcome obstacle, as vulnerable leaders tend to build complementary teams, leverage the DNI, takes feedback, and encourages learning from failure. What I'm trying to explain here is when we assess the people leadership for an individ individual, we tend to even go further and try to understand which type of uh, leader is. Is he a vulnerable leader? Is he an heroic leader? And does he have the ability to span from that notion to the other one and adapt to different situations? So this is becoming super sophisticated. 
but we also use a lot of tools, psychometric tests, uh, you know, we benchmark, we cross information, um, all that kind of things that we use to assess not only our skills, which is probably the, the, the easiest part, but also soft skills. Um, and I would, I would just stop by saying everything, uh, you know, talks about who you are in the way you interact in when you, when you talk to, uh, to a consultant uh, uh, or in, an, in, a, in a search, in the way you speak to the assistant, in the way you listen, in the way you react. So deep assessment, um, uh, tools, and the way, the way you interact with people. This is the way we, we assess soft skills. So soft skills matter. Great, thank you. Does any other speaker want to touch on uh, developing internal talent um, and thinking about soft skills and bringing people up into leadership? Well, maybe to rebound on what Florence was saying, um, it's about building the, the trust and the, and the, um, the, 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 the inclusive um, uh, situation. Uh, it's also about uh, how do you, you, you make people, um, you, you give some, uh, ah, sorry, uh, um, I, I, I forgot it, <laughs> I'm sorry. That's the vulnerable piece of the leader. Yeah, let's be authentic, you know, I, think, I believe in authenticity, I, I missed it, sorry. No, but, but back, back to the point, so you, can, you will have it back in your mind. Uh, back to the point of how do we develop, we develop. I think we, as leaders, we have a peculiar role, nevertheless, which is the one of making sure that we are not just throwing somebody uh, in, uh, on, on the wall or making sure that we're not just putting somebody in an uncomfortable situation. We need to be able to stand behind them. We need to be able to give feedback. And of course, it has to be constructive feedback. And, and I think we have a peculiar role there, and which is probably more on a one-to-one -one basis uh, in, in many cases, especially if you're talking about leaders. But if you forget for, for one second just the leaders and you go to a broader population of managers, everybody is a leader in a, in a management team. I think it is about very much uh, what I was saying before, making sure that there are some rules of the game that are not only said, but are really, that are very much lived um, lived by. So the openness, the transparency, the giving the feedback, uh, the uh, making sure that you can, you or the manager can leverage as much as possible on the differences that exist within the team. Because one other, one other topic which I think is important is that there is the, the diversity that makes the richness and not the other way around. So it's really about uh, understanding who do you have on the team and who the manager has on his team and at the same time helping him uh, leveraging at best the, the, the specific skills and competencies, not just the hard ones, but the, but the soft one as well, to make sure that the overall impact of that team is greater than just the sum of the individuals. So just building on that, um, how do you go about rewarding or incentivizing both managers and employees um, to uh, sort of role model or identify those uh, skills within, within their teammates and who they work with? Well, at Bell, um, we, are, we are changing our appraisal system going into and talking about impact, because in the end, that's what it is about. And the impact is based on half is about the priorities, so the projects and the, the results, and half of it is about those behaviors I was talking about, uh, which are assessed by the manager, but potentially by some other people. Uh, and I, I found back what I wanted to say earlier, um, talking about this, um, this inc the importance of soft skills, and probably the higher you go in the hierarchy, the, the higher and the bigger soft skills are important. Um, and, uh, and, and, and it, because of the, you know, because of hybrid work, because of uh, many uh, evolution, the evolution of, of the way we work, it's getting very complicated for manager. Being manager is very complicated, more and more complicated. And by the way, uh, at some point, um, we, we had a thinking in the company saying, okay, but you know, if you want to grow up the ladder and move up the ladder in the company and in grade and in, in salary, you need to go through management. But some people don't want to manage or they are not fit for management. 
And so we say, okay, maybe then we can have another way, which would be kind of an expert uh, path. And I was talking to uh, managers about that uh, maybe two weeks ago, and one of them said, yeah, but if you do that, nobody would want to be managers. <laughs> Interesting. I think I thought it, about it. I think that this is a very, this is a very good point uh, because the growth of somebody is not only coming from taking management responsibility. Uh, on the contrary, there are a number of other paths that should be pursued. That is not always easy from a company perspective, uh, but there are other paths which are expert paths, which can be commercial path or, or whatever. Where still the individual, even if he works alone, uh, can be rewarded and can be praised for the value that is bringing to the organization. Probably, uh, somehow, basically what I'm saying is that not management and leadership is not fit for everybody. But it's not because it's not fit for everybody that those that do not necessarily fit into this quote-unquote category are bad persons or, or bad colleagues, on the contrary. If I may add to that, well, first, being a manager is difficult. Try being a politician <laughs> <laughs> who used to be a manager. Um, but, but what I hear in this discussion is, is sorry to say, it's a very hierarchical discussion. Huh? A manager and a manager of managers, and, and you get through all the skills. Where what I see more and more in organizations and in life is that leadership is not definitely not the same as management, but it can come from many different uh, people around you. It can come from your young daughters, it can come from the cleaning lady. Um, and leadership is so much more than you know, what kind of rewards do you give? How do you build your company structure? And we've all at least moved from the, you know, the triangle and then we put the triangle upside down. That was the new way to draw a company and then we drew, drew circles. Well, and then I went into politics, so I don't know what the next uh, fashion is, but it all shows that we're thinking about that leadership is not necessarily the same as being the manager, as being the boss. And I think that's the most important notion. Leadership also comes from your customers. It comes from your suppliers. It comes from your youngest employee. And that we need to start to recognize because else we, we won't live in this world. And so soft skills, you know, soft skills are a bit the age factor, the human factor. And, and as, as you say, you know, we're talking about managers, it's not just a bit about managers, it's about peer relationship, it's about managing your boss, by the way, that's a big one too, and, and it's managing your, your fam family members, your friends, you know, it applies everywhere. Yeah, and I just want, want to add something, talking about the ones who wants to become leaders, and especially female leaders. And we're talking about that in France a lot because of the Loire Ixien, right? So we have to think about those careers in a different way and not only to discuss about hard skills when we manage women's or female uh, career, but also combine, have that combination of hard, soft, very important, and potential in order to promote these females to leadership roles if they really want to uh, to move to that uh, to that role. That is really important, huh? and it's the only way where we're going to accelerate this movement of um, you know mo uh, helping, supporting females becoming uh, leaders and members eventually, if that's a, if that they want, of course, uh, of executive committee. And, and I think to, to actually arrive at that situation where we start to appoint not just more women, but more diverse candidates, uh, people of color with a non-Dutch or non-French last name, uh, you name it, we have to have courageous leaders who will take that step. And I really believe that people who've been in a diverse position, so to say, like me, being a woman in a man's world, you have to double-proof yourself to be where you are. Uh, so those are people who are usually more, have more tenacity, have more past performance even than the, the normal men on the same position. And if you start to realize that, then you can start to actually make those appointments. And then you come to the famous French saying that equality has, we will only reach equality once we have as many bad female leaders as we have bad male leaders. So, uh, Minister, coming back to your point around inclusive environments, um, in what ways can employers, uh, educational institutions, and society create a more inclusive environment that fosters the development of soft skills and that truly ensure that women have equal opportunities to be bad leaders? <laughs> 
Again, a very broad question. Um, but I like to take it broader to, to the broader society. Um, and then you're actually also talking about the future already. Um, what do we need in the future? We need soft skills, yes. But we need a society um, that has a certain cohesiveness, that's cohesive. Where people feel that they belong to this society, that they have a role to play, that they have perspective in life, perspective, that they have a certain certainty in life. And at this moment, we have big fracture lines in our societies. Um, we do not have equitable opportunities. It does matter where you're born. Um, it does matter where you're educated, which country you're from, if you're male or female. Um, but mostly we have a large part of our population that today doesn't feel that their interests are taken into account. That's also diversity of opinion, that's diversity of perspective. And those people say, you're not listening to us. You're not taking my interests into account. And so you see, it can lead to Brexit, it can lead to the Dutch elections last week. But if we don't solve that, if we are not an inclusive society where there's room for everybody and where people feel that they belong and feel that there's perspective for them, social upward mobility, it's a big word, but you need to have that for a middle class. And we're lacking that. And it's actually decreasing. The social upward mobility in Europe is decreasing. And that brings so much pressure to our societies. And what we do need is we need those cohesion in societies also to be able to manage, combat climate change, migration, geopolitical instability, demography, you name it. The next 10 years, we will face so many challenges. If we don't build inclusive, diverse, cohesive societies, we can forget about all those challenges. It starts with inclusion. It starts with all the people who feel that they belong, a sense of belonging, in our societies. If, if I may just uh, I, I fully agree with, with the minister, I would like to take a, another angle as well uh, to, this, uh, to this point, which is it is about fighting this equality. And fighting this equality, it has very much to do with education. So I think that there, there, there's a number of areas where we can do much better in terms of education, in terms of bringing, uh, somehow making sure that there are the conditions where everybody, uh, uh, but it's not about dif gender differences, it's about probably societal differences. Everybody can, can get to the same level. So it, it, it starts with uh, financial literacy. We had, a, we had a discussion at the table earlier on, on financial literacy and a number of other aspects where education plays a key role and there where there is where I think governments uh, and, and politics together with the with the private sector can probably uh, tie up together to 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 bring number of programs to raise somehow to avoid the, to eliminate this equality and to raise the bar Sorry to add something, because we have a lot of programs, both in the Netherlands, European, in France. We have women on company boards, we have financial uh, programs, poverty programs. But we need to go back to that mindset of really trying to give people extra opportunities. Um, and when you look at education, I think education and entrepreneurship are two ways out of poverty. That's true. But when you look at education today, at least in the Netherlands, I don't know the French numbers, but they're about the same. If you have a higher education, and if you, if you have a non-Dutch last name, your chances on a fixed contract are 40% less after a year and a half. That's what we do with unconscious or conscious um, biases. It used to be the same for women. We're catching up there now, but we have a huge catch up to do uh, for people with a non-Dutch or non-French last name, of color, of maybe a different career path as well, who come later to the labor market because they have had some incident that took them out. We really have to get more inclusive because if we don't, then what's happening? These people are well educated, they feel they're talented, they're passionate, they want to do their job, and they don't find a job or they don't find a job at their own level. And that builds a frustration. And that comes back to the question of what kind of society you want to be. All right, well, we have a few minutes uh, to take any questions from uh, the audience. And uh, we have one in the front. I'll repeat the question. So, so just to uh, repeat the question, um, where do soft skills come from? Um, 
where are they taught? Um, where do they? Where are they taught? Because I'm sorry, but everybody's talking about them as though they already are there, and then you can just go looking for them. But where are? Yeah, since we're both educators, wh where are they supposed to be taught? Is, it, is this it. young people, college, uh, work environment? I mean, we need to have a path for people to get them, or you're never going to have people who are equipped with. Th that's equipment. a good question. My answer would be all your life. You know, it's, it can be at school, it can be from your experience, it can be with the relationship with people, you can have mentors, you can have feedback on what you do. And it's based, in the end, you behave. That's why we go through behaviors, because you behave. And then, then you realize that behind those behaviors, you, you, you can express them in terms of skills and soft skills. So I'm not sure it's satisfying. I'm not sure you're satisfied with my answer, but I think it's, it's not, you know, you're not learning uh, from, uh, from five to 12 and then that's done. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an everyday process. At school, uh, in sp playing sports, um, in companies, uh, at university. At home? At home with your family and friends. Intuition. Yeah. It is something you have in you, actually, and it, it is, you have to, you know, unlock it, be aware of it, unlock it, work on it, ask for, fe ask for feedback. Um, and, and I would say, by the way, if we, if we compare Anglo-Saxon, I'm trying to do something that is a bit dangerous here, but anyway, if you compare, uh, you know, Anglo-Saxon education to French, which is quite traditional, where you, it's much more conservative in a way, and Anglo-Saxon where you are asked to, uh, you know, to, where you learn how to speak on stage, where you express yourself, etc. These are soft skills, actually. And, and in this type of education, it, it, it's easier, in my view, to, uh, to develop them. But it's a potential, it's something you have in you. On the point of education, uh, for example, one may, big difference is whether we assess the, 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 the students on only on the facts, on what are they good at. And, and sometimes when you only uh, evaluate them on their math, on their math, on their, on their composition and so forth, you're only looking again somehow at the what. And they're not necessarily looking and or fostering what are these kids very good at. They may not be good at math, but they may, may be very good at doing something else. They may be very good at engaging with the rest of the class. And so if we, if we then there is an evaluation and a promotion of some of this or putting some, of some emphasis on this, it can, it can show to the, to the kid that it's very good at math but it's not helping anybody, that maybe just being good at math and not helping anybody is not necessarily the only way of behaving. There are other ways of behaving as well. So we, we cannot give you a, probably a straightforward answer, but it's really throughout, almost throughout every steps and in every, in every environment. And I think the family one is a very important one as well. We have a burning question over uh, there. Yeah, unfortunately, I think we're at the end. I'm sorry, but I do want to allow the minister to respond if you'd like to, to this question. Um, well, I, I think we, I, I already today, again, I learned some soft skills. Um, and that is, that is really listening to people, trying to understand, uh, but mostly then looking back in your own heart and say, what did I just hear? What did I just learn? Why did I feel awkward about it? Oh, maybe that has something to do with myself. And sometimes you learn the most at home from your own children. I have teenage daughters, so I learn something every day. Um, <laughs> but being honest about it, trying to learn it, trying to adapt to it. And I have one rule. Every Friday afternoon, I look in the mirror and I say to myself, has somebody been critical about me? And not just my teenage daughters, but at work, about your style, about content, about anything. Because it's one, to become successful. It's two, to remain successful. But it's three, to have lasting impact. And you only have lasting impact when you have the courage to, after a long time of success, still have the people around you who tell you the truth from once to all. So, thank you so much, everybody, and thank you so much to our speakers for the great discussion. Thank you. Thank you.